exceptions of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimahullah ta'ala range from group to group. So many people who are not raised upon an understanding of who Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was have many misconceptions regarding him. This was true yesterday as well as today. In the time of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, Rahimahullah, there was a famous scholar who goes by the title of Siraj al-Fuqaha. He is one of the teachers of Al-Allama, Faith Ahmad Awasi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And he was an expert in the science of inheritance laws. He, Rahimahullah, at one time had questions, difficult questions relating to inheritance law, Ilmul Mirath. He sent those questions to Nadwatul Ulama in Lucknow, in India, and he sent those questions also to Darul Ulum Dioband, which is also in UP, India. And he did not receive satisfactory answers. After a while, he mentions that he thought of this figure known as Ahmad Rida Khan, who lived in the town of Bareilly, but this figure according to his perception, was someone who only discussed controversial issues. Siraj al-Fuqaha, rahimullah, bought some of the works of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. He read those works and he was impressed. Even though the perception he had of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was that this was a scholar who only was involved in polemics. So he wrote down his questions and sent them to Bareilly. When those questions reached Bareilly, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, wrote down the answers. They reached Siraj al Fuqaha, who was impressed, immensely impressed. And those questions and answers have been published. I have a copy of those uh, answers, even though they are not published in the Fatawa. Siraj al Fuqaha realized that he had the wrong perception of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. Rahimullah. So he traveled to the town of Bareilly, but by the time he reached Bareilly, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, had passed away. And he met the son of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, known as Mustafa Rida Khan. Rahimullah. Siraj al Fuqaha, prior to being impressed by Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, was from Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, yet he had the wrong perceptions of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. There are many Sunni Muslims today within the UK and other places who still have wrong conceptions regarding Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan and regarding the followers of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. Ta'ala. Many years ago, when I was 13 years old, a person gave me a book by the name of the Barelvis by Ihsan Ilahi Zahir, which was mentioned prior to me. I thank that person now for giving me that book because I read that book at that age. And this led me to buy the fatawa of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, which were not entirely published in the modern form. The edition of Lahore, in Lahore, which was published in Lahore by uh, Al Allama Abdul Qayyum Hazarwi, Rahimullah, Rida Foundation uh, edition. I bought some of those volumes, and later on, when the entire fatawa was published after the passing away of uh, Mufti of Pakistan, uh, Al Allama Abdul Qayyum, Rahimullah, the entire edition was completed. I thank those people now because when I read that book, that book attempted to give Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan the image of a, a polytheist or an extremist. But after reading the works for myself, I realized that Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was far from that. So I can relate to the the experience of Siraj al-Fuqaha rahimullah. And there are many Sunni Muslims today who have this wrong perception regarding Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. They may ask, what relevance do the fatawa, the verdicts of Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan have in the modern society? He wrote many works like Ahkam sharia books of fatawa, Ahkam sharia Fatawa Afriqa, Irfan sharia and his famous work, Al-Ataya al nabawiyya Fil-Fatawa al ridawiyya 
So someone may ask, what relevance do these books have today? You state that he is a figure that must be followed, but yet he is mistaken in his verdict on the stationary earth. He gave a verdict that the earth is stationary and modern science has proven him wrong. Or they may say that Imam Ahmad Khan gave the verdict that the hukka, which is um, uh, known famously as jilm, is permissible, yet many scholars today say that the hukka is bad for the health, the, the tobacco. Even al Alama Fayyid Ahmed Awasi wrote a verdict stating that tobacco is impermissible. So what relevance does this Imam have today if some of his uh, verdicts were mistaken? The reply to that would be that the methodology of Al Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan, even in those verdicts which some may consider him to have been mistaken, is very important to take note of. For instance, regarding the stationary earth, Al Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan, rahimullah, his position, his manhaj, his methodology was that science does not interpret the Quran. Science does not interpret the Quran. The Quran is not subject to change with new discoveries of science. And this methodology is what is important when reading the fatwa regarding the stationary earth. Even though uh, people will say that the observable earth is moving, but the methodology of Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan rahimullah, is important. Also regarding the fatwa and the hukka, what he said regarding this, he refuted a forged hadith. Someone forged a hadith where they said that tobacco was mentioned by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The principle which Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan was defending was the principle that anything which was not mentioned by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa as being uh, impermissible cannot be deemed as uh, the Messenger of Allah cannot be deemed as impermissible if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did not give that verdict, that fatwa. So he was refuting a group of people from Afghanistan who forged a hadith regarding tobacco. This methodology was correct. So therefore, when analyzing the fatwa of Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan in the modern context, we can divide these fatwa into three categories. The first category would be al-masailu al fiha issues which are differed over even amongst ahl sunnati wal jama'ah and scholars within ahl sunnati wal jama'ah some of them may take a different position for instance women visiting graves the fatwa in the hanafi school the tarjih preferred opinion according to al-imam ahmad Ridha khan is that women cannot visit graves because it leads to fitna tribulation because of the mixing of the different genders and other scholars took a position that this is permissible if the the women are veiled and they do not mix with the people but Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan was following the law of Saddu Dharai which is uh, placing a barrier onto any means which may lead to the impermissible so the context of those fatawa must be looked at and also understood as to what principles Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan rahimullah, was following. In the modern age, we know that Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan was correct, that within, wherever there are shrines and graves, there is the tribulation of the mixes, mixing of the genders where this law is not enforced, that it is, uh, that it is impermissible for women to visit graves. Other examples is the fatwa ajlal i'lam, which is a book written by the Imam, which in the modern edition was placed in the first volume. This book was written to show that the verdict in the Hanafi school is always given upon the statement of Al Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimullah, further emphasizing an important aspect that fatwa is not given upon aberrant statements, uh, which is a statement which is. Uh, the fatwa is not given upon that statement. For instance, today someone may give the verdict that women can travel without a mahram. This is not the verdict in any one of the four schools. Even in the Maliki and Shafi'i school, the verdict is only given in the necessity of hajj. And even then it has its conditions. 
So a, an, a fatwa is not given out of the school without a necessity. And within the school, you do not give an aberrant, a shav qawl. In the same way, Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, mentioned the importance of not doing talfiq. Talfiq is mixing between the schools in such a way that acting upon, what, uh, upon all the schools in such a way that the action of worship is not permissible in any of the schools. This is impermissible also. And also that the fatwa changes uh, with darura and haja, necessity and need, dire need. This is very important. For instance, a woman whose husband runs away, if we follow the Hanafi school, the woman would have to wait one century for her husband to return. This is something which is a necessity. Therefore, the scholars give the verdict according to the other schools where she would have to wait four years or about that time period. So this shows that at times of necessity, Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahmullah, like the scholars before him, uh, Muhammad Al-Amin Ibn Abidin, rahmullah, the author of the Hashia, Raddul Muhtar, they looked at, he wrote a book known as Sharh Uqud al-Rasmi Mufti, where they looked at the needs of the people of that time. Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahmullah, mentions that if someone enters a masjid and he sees someone praying, nawafil, optional prayer, in the time of zawal, zawal is when the, the prayer is makru, disliked, he should leave that person alone because that action may be permissible in the other schools. Because this is an act of worship, he should leave them. For instance, recently we were reading Nur al-Iddah and in, the, in Nur al-Iddah they mentioned that congregating in mid-Sha'ban in the Masajid is uh, disliked because it is an innovation. But in this day and age when people do so, we do not prohibit them because this is an issue which is differed over amongst the scholars. For instance, Ibn Salah, considered this permissible and Al-Izz bin Abdi Salam rahimullah, considered this action impermissible. So these are issues which are differed amongst Sunni Muslims. In the same way, Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, wrote a book called Lum'atu Duha Fi Ifa'i Liha which was regarding growing the beards and he gave the tarjih, the preferred opinion that trimming the beard less than one fist is makru tahriman prohibitively disliked. This was the preferred opinion according to him within the school of the Hanafis. Someone may say that there is a difference of opinion within the school. Some scholars state that it is sunnah, others state wajib, like a Sheikh Abdul Haq, uh, Muhaddith, uh, Muhaddith uh, Delhi, rahimullah, he states uh, the same as Imam Ahmad al Khan. But other scholars use the word sunnah. So, uh, in Waqar al fatawa for instance, he states sunnah qareeb bil wajib that it is a sunnah which is very near wajib essential. Someone may say that we do not agree with the tarjih, the preference of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. What is the relevance of this fatwa today? I would say that this fatwa is similar to the fatwa of Imam Muhammad bin Ja'far al-Kattani where he wrote a da'ama fi ahkami sunnati al-imama where he wrote a book on recommending al-imama, wearing the imama. What was the purpose he said that the, the imama is recommended for everyone. What was the purpose of these scholars? Remember, they were contemporaries, both Al-Imam Al-Kattani and Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, Rahmullah. What was the purpose of these verdicts? It was to preserve Sha'ir al-Islam. Those things which are the hallmarks of Islam from amongst them was the beard. Another example of a fatwa which a person may dispute is the alam al-alam bi anna al-hinda dar al-Islam. That Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, gave the verdict that India in his time is Darul Islam. Some people misinterpret this fatwa. They say India was colonized by the British at that time. So why did he give this fatwa? Within the very same verdict, he mentions that the colonialists shall soon move from India because their strength was waning, finishing, and they would no longer remain in that country. But the background to that fatwa was that certain groups gave a verdict that all the Indian Muslims must leave India and go to Afghanistan and other countries. Therefore, many thousands of Muslims attempted to leave India. When they reached the borders of Afghanistan, they perished and many of them were martyred. Seeing the danger of this verdict, Imam Ahmad Rida Khan said, if the Muslims remain in India and once the British go away, from India, those Muslims who remain in India, they will attain 
they will subjugate the land and ha the, the power will return back to those Indian Muslims. This was the context of the fatwa. It was not a pro-British fatwa. This is similar to the fatwa uh, today the, the, uh, that people, some deviants give the verdict, like Nasruddin al-Albani said that the Palestinians should leave uh, Israel, uh, uh, occupied Palestine and reform themselves in other Muslim countries. But this verdict is wrong. The, if we follow the verdict of Imam Ahmed Rida Khan, the modern verdict would be that the Palestinians should remain in occupied Israel and should remain in Palestine and fight and resist the occupation. So this is the relevance of this verdict of Imam Ahmed Rida Khan to this modern age. Also, Imam Ahmed Rida Khan refused to unite with Gandhi, who was the leader of uh, the movement against the British at that time, while the Diobandia united with Gandhi. And in the modern context, they interpret this to being pro-British. But the reality was, Imam Ahmed Rida Khan viewed the Hindus and the British in the same light. He said unity with the British is impermissible, and unity with the Hindus was also impermissible, even for political purposes. Imam Ahmed Rida Khan refused to meet Gandhi, when Gandhi attempted to enter Bareilly, and the followers of Imam Ahmed Rida Khan surrounded the town and said, we would not allow the, the uh, Indra Gandhi into this city. What also proves Imam Ahmed Rida Khan had contempt against the British was that Imam Ahmed Rida Khan, whenever stamping a letter, he would place the stamp of Queen Victoria upside down. This is considered in, uh, in, in British law, this would, uh, was considered as a violation of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the law, and therefore Imam Ahmed Rida Khan would turn the stamp upside down. And uh, when he wrote his famous fatwa, Shamaimul Ambar, Fi Adabi Nida'i Amam al Mimbar, Fi Adabi Nida'i Amam al Mimbar, which was relating to the Adhan. Some Sunni scholars held the view that the Adhan should, not, uh, should be given in the masjid, can be given in the masjid. It is permissible to give in the masjid. Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan rahimullah, said the Adhan should be given at the door of the masjid. And it is impermissible to give the Adhan in the masjid. This is an example of a differed over issue. Some of the people uh, sent uh, 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 to the courts that Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan should be done for libel. So they sent the police to arrest Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan. This is something well le less known amongst people. Why did they send the police? Because Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan refused to attend the court of the British. He refused to acknowledge the governance of the British, the colonialists at that time. So when he refused, they sent the police and the followers of Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan surrounded his house. Then the police was uh, forced to retreat because they feared a riot in Bareilly. Because they feared a riot in Bareilly, they retreated. In the same way, Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan gave a verdict. Now, this is an example of disputed issues that Sama and Qawwali are impermissible. Even though other scholars gave the verdict that Sama and Qawwali are permissible. But the reason for this, the wisdom behind this, was that Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan saw the danger which the modern Qawwal and the modern Sama, even though this is not stated by Imam Ahmed Rida Khan explicitly, but one can see, for instance, in the fatawa of Sayyid Alawi bin Abbas al-Maliki, rahimullah, he mentions also that the impermissibility of Qawwali is because of saddu dharai, a means to barring further impermissible, uh, impermissible act. For instance, some people, they will say Sama is permissible, Qawwali is permissible, but then they move to listening to music. And we know even the people who did Sama, their Sama was such that it was not done in front of live audiences. So this was the wisdom behind the fatwa even on Qawwali and Sama. In the same way, Al Imam Ahmed Rida Khan rahimullah, gave verdicts regarding Tasawwuf. And in Fatawa Afriqa, he gave a very important verdict regarding Tasawwuf that the, the vast majority of the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance which people give today, is oath of baraka of blessings. And it is not bay'ah to suluk. Many people who give the oath uh, of uh, the uh, allegiance, they seem to think that they have entered suluk. Many of them think they are uh, Mawlana Rumi and their sheikh is Shams Tabrezi. When this in reality is mistaken, 
if we follow the verdict of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, we will come to acknowledge the fact that the vast majority of the bay'ah today, the oath of allegiance today is bay'atul baraka and not bay'atul suluk. In the same way, Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahmullah, gave verdicts on al-masailul mujma'atu alayha. This is very important to understand that those verdicts, those issues which are agreed upon by Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a, are those verdicts re relevant today? Those verdicts are more relevant than the pre previous category. For instance, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, gave a verdict as Zubta tu Zakiya li Tahrimi Sajda Tahiyya, prohibiting people from giving, doing Sajda prostration to their peers or spiritual guides or giving prostration to the graves, that this action is haram, impermissible. And if the person intends worship of the person, then it is kufr. But otherwise, it is haram. Today, even in Pakistan, people who claim to follow Ali Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, rahimullah, they still perform prostration to graves. If you go to places in Lahore like Data Darbar, there are people performing prostrations to graves kissing graves when Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan clearly states in Ahkamu Sharia that if someone goes to a grave he should stand four arm, arm lengths away from the grave and he should not do a circumambulation tawaf of the grave these are acts of impermissible haram so these are this is something agreed upon by Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a because when we discuss issues there there are those issues which are differed over but this issue is agreed upon by all of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a another example of this is the fatwa of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, Fatawa al Haramain bi Rajfi Nadwat al Main. This verdict was regarding sharing the stage with deviant people. Now, the wisdom behind this verdict, some people may perceive these verdicts as being harsh. Are they harsh? No. Because the, the condition for a, a Sunni scholar to attend any gathering with deviant scholars, the verdict as given by Imam Yusuf al Nabahani, and by Imam Ahmad Rida Khan is not that a Sunni scholar cannot attend their events. What do they say? That that scholar must be mutamakkin, very learned. And when he does attend their events, he must make very clear that they, their beliefs are incorrect and he must correct them on their mistakes. If a Sunni scholar fails to do so, he has committed haram. We do not say he is not from Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, we state he is in the realm for not doing so. So this fatwa is not harsh. In the same way, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan states that a Sunni Muslim can meet the common person from the deviant groups and be kind to them. This is the verdict of Al Imam Al Ghazali rahimullah also and Al Imam Al Nabahani. The people who are the common people, scholars and students of knowledge, or even laymen who are more learned than those deviant laymen, they must guide those people with kindness because al awamuk al an'am they say the common man is like cattle so in order to guide those people we can show kindness to them but the harshness is only shown to the scholars of the deviants the harshness is not shown to the laymen so these are things which need to be clarified by sunni scholars and we we must understand also that these verdicts are not harsh. The, the verdict of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan is not harsh. This is a message even for people today that, save, uh, that share stages with deviants, Sunni people, that we are not being harsh towards you. We are advising you as our brothers that these verdicts of Al, uh, Al Imam Yusuf al-Nabahani, read these verdicts, Sabilun Najat of Al Imam Yusuf al-Nabahani and Fatawa al-Haramain bi Rajfi Nadwat al-Main. They give exact precise hadith from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that scholars can be kind to deviants who are common laymen but when they share a stage with the scholars of the deviants they must correct those scholars in the same way Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan gave a very precise verdict called taqlid. this verdict was regarding the prohibition of praying behind those people who opposed the lead of uh, following, blind following, one of the four schools. The verdict on praying behind uh, innovators given by him was that it is makru tahriman, it is prohibitively disliked. There is a detail to this verdict that some people are saying that the books of fiqh, like Hashia ibn Abdin, states that if there is a congregation and there is a uh, uh, of deviants 
and there is a person has the option to pray alone, which one of the two should he do? Should he pray with the congregation or pray on his own? Ibn Abdin rahimullah states, he should pray with the congregation. Some people say that therefore this fatwa is wrong, but they have misunderstood the fatwa itself. Al-Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahimullah, when he states that it is impermiss, it is makru, prohibitively disliked to pray behind deviants, is referring to that bid'ah which is referred to as bid'ah khafifa, which is referred to as a light bid'ah. For instance, tafdil, giving superiority to someone over the shaykhain in certain aspects, uh, which are agreed upon by Ahl Sunnah, or someone who leaves the following of a school. But what he, what, what is the legal verdict of praying behind someone who commits kufr disbelief, or kufr which is uh, iltizam, which is certain disbelief, and that kufr which is doubtful disbelief, all the jurists agree that prayer behind such a person is impermissible. So this verdict itself has a more detail which Imam Ahmad Rida Khan uh, gives uh, elucidation to in other words. We do not have the time for that. In the same way, Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan rahmullah, has another work, Subhan al Sabuh and Aibi Kith bin Maqbuh, which is regarding attributing a lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? For someone to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to lie is impermissible. Now, in one case, someone misquoted this fatwa to me. And this is something very important for anyone who does not read the verdicts of Imam Ahmad al Khan. Someone quoted this fatwa to me that Imam Ahmad al Khan has insulted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said, in which work? The person quoted this book. I brought the book to the person and said, show me the verdict. Because I knew that the contents of the very same book he is quoting is in order to establish the transcendency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A third category of the fatawa of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan are daruriyatul deen, essential aspects of the religion. Two examples of this. One is that Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was one of the first scholars to refute Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He wrote a work known as Qahrud Diyan and many other works. Secondly, he wrote a book called Raddu Rifda, which was a refutation of the Rawafid, which is a, 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 today people refer to them as Shia. Why did he refer to them as disbelievers? Because they believed that the Quran was, was tampered. This is disbelief. And the third group that he refuted, amongst many other groups, is a group that believed in Al Wujudul Mutlaq, that everything around us is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is also disbelief. Now, before finishing, I wanted to mention two points. Number one is that there is a danger of us, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, scholars, students, and the laymen, that we do not distinguish between these three issues. Number one is issues which are validly disputed amongst Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Number two are those issues which are agreed upon by Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And number three are those issues which are necessities of the religion. With regard to necessities of the religion and issues which are agreed upon by Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, it is essential for all groups, whether they belong to a certain tariqah or whether they belong a Sufi order or whether they belong to a certain organization or any masajid like this masjid or any of our Sunni masajid to make a clear distinction that if any speaker or any group attempts to violate the consensus of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah or the, the essentials of this religion, then we must be very firm on our belief. Otherwise, these masajid have been built on money raised in the name of such scholars like Al Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. This, this very masjid was built upon the name of Sayyiduna Sultan Bahu Rahmullah, who was not a person who associated with deviants. Therefore, the principles of those scholars must be upheld. And people such as myself should not be viewed as extremists simply because we are calling for a unity based upon consensus opinions. When we, when, when we point out that certain opinions are not consensus, please do not view me as an extremist because I, I bring you, I br anyone can come to me and show me that those issues, why are they not consensus? Show me from the books of Kalam, from the books of the Fuqaha.